Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. GSNC Basketball Podcast, right here on the GSNC Podcast Network. I am your host, Bryce Lewis, and obviously we have another show of basketball news and discussion to talk about today on the podcast. Obviously, you know, listen, a lot of stuff's happening right now, and you know we're getting closer to playoff time, believe it or not, in the NBA, as the playoffs will start this week. So, obviously, by the time... My ex episode that comes out, we will probably have our may, most likely we will have our playoff matchups for the most part solidified or just about solidified in terms of just most seedings. Obviously, we won't have the eighth spot solidified as for the first time. Obviously, there will be a playing game that's already been officially decided that there will be a playing game. So that won't maybe be decided by that point, but we should have all the other seeds, you know, pretty much decided. Um, you know, so today's show, we're going to talk about, like I said, things still happening in the bubble. We're going to break down potential playoff matchups so far, the way standings look right now, since more teams are starting to lock in their seeding. So we're going to go ahead and get into that. Uh, we're also going to talk about, you know, break, breakout stars and, and, and team struggles. So we're going to talk about all that here on the podcast because you know what we do here. We talk about everything that is basketball related. We also going to get some college basketball talk later in the show as well. But so we're going to get right into it. And we're going to we're, we're going to start with T.J. Warren. T.J. Warren has been, as some people say, the bubble MVP, the bubble Hall of Fame. Everything that you can ever say to describe T.J. Warren ever since the restart has began, he has been. He has single handedly been one of. The best players in the bubble, if not the best player in the bubble since the bubble's return. He has been, he, I believe he's averaging 34 points a game right now on 60% shooting and he's shooting 55% from three. TJ Warren has been an absolute beast and he was a big component of part of the Indiana Pacers beating the Lakers on Saturday night. He has really taken off for them. And it brings up the question of, is TJ Warren finally, is this his breakout party? Is this his, this is now TJ Warren. Pacers have them another start with Oladipo and Brogdon and, and Sabonis. You know, like, like, like that's the question. Is this like who he t- truly is now? Or is this maybe just an anomaly in the bubble where he's just playing great basketball now, but he'll get, he'll, he'll go back to where he was. I mean, if we remember TJ Warren coming out of NC State, he always had talent to score. He was always a talented scorer at, at NC State. Always a talented score. So him scoring the ball isn't necessarily crazy because most players who can score can score, regardless. Like Michael Beasley was a great scorer in college. And even in the NBA, even though he never really had the career he would have that people think he could have had as a number two overall draft pick, every time you brought Beasley in, you know he can put up buckets. He can do that. So TJ Warren obviously was drafted by the Suns. His his career never really took off with the Suns. He was at at best maybe people thought was an average player. Uh, you know, just was, he really never had any memorable moments. And obviously, if you remember this past off season, TJ Warren was traded to the Indiana Pacers for cash considerations. So think about that. Like usually, you know, if people give up a draft pick, another player, maybe swap players. No, they said, Hey, we literally will give you TJ Warren if you give us some money. Like, and obviously TJ Warren, if you remember during the off season, when that happened, he did come out and say that that stung. That, that hurt him a little bit because it's like he thought he was a part of Phoenix's future and they traded him away for basically some some dollars, some dollars on the dime for some cap space. And so obviously I'm sure that was a motivation for him. I mean, any end of the season, he's played well. Again, nothing crazy. And I think that's why, you know, him doing what he's doing right now is so, I think, shocking and fascinating to a lot of people around the NBA because, you know, He's breaking out now, and he's 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 being the reason why Indiana is 
still very formidable in the Eastern Conference. It's, it's crazy because if you think about the team, you, you know, they kind of needed this. You know, they lost to Sabonis. For, for all we know, Sabonis is out for the rest of the bubble. For the rest of the time, they're in the, the bubble. Especially so assuming Vignetta does not get past the first round. He will be out. And he was their, some people would consider potentially outside of Victor Oladipo, a healthy Victor Oladipo, their best player. And then you have Michael Brockton. And so now you lost a bonus, but TJ Warren's a scoring machine. And now it's just like, okay, it's kind of counter set of the loss. And Indiana's still just as formidable as they were previously. And, and it makes you kind of wonder about, man, what if Sabonis was able to get back? If he was able to play like he was always able to play, obviously at this point it will be interesting because obviously he's never really played except I think one, two scrimmage games where he got hurt. So obviously his in shapeness and being some bonus that we know would probably not happen necessarily right away if, if, if at all during it. But, you know, it kind of gets you fit, excited. Like, you know, you got Victor Oladipo, Michael Brockton, Sabonis, TJ Warren. If they're all playing at the level they can potentially play at, it kind of makes you feel like, dang, the Indiana Pacers, they may not have that quote-unquote superstar, but they have four legitimate all-stars if TJ Warren continue to play at this level. And that's still formidable enough to get you you know, somewhere in, in, in the Eastern Conference and potentially maybe making a run of everybody, you know, like I said, has, has, has good games and, and plays at the level they can play, play at. And, you know, I think this TJ Warren that we're seeing is around to stay. I think this TJ Warren will be around, you know, he'll, he'll be around. He'll be around. I don't, I don't think... This is a fluke. I, I think this is who TJ... Now, obviously, I think when Sabonis comes back... You have to think about the situation, though, with Indiana. You got Victor Oladipo coming back from an injury, so he's still working his way back to being Victor Oladipo without limitations. Michael Brogdon was never known as a scorer in the first place, even though he can score the ball. And so, basically, Sabonis was their... Out of the, like, Sabonis was the guy at the moment when the bubble started who was probably going to be their best offensive player. Then he got hurt. So now they, and then like I said, Ole Deep was working his way back. Brought the can score, but that's not really his game to be a scorer. So you, then you, TJ Warren basically took that role and said, okay, now I'll be the scorer. I'll be the guy who puts up the big buckets. And then Ole Depot can work his way back and then get back to where he is. And Michael Brockton can pitch in and he can do what he do. And then boom, now you still got three guys who can score. And it, and it feels like you're not losing you know, as much. I mean, if you think about their starting lineup, potentially in the future, it could be a Brockton, Oladipo, Warren, Miles Turner, and Sabonis lineup. That's a pretty solid starting lineup in the Eastern, like in, 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 the, in the league, really. Because remember, Miles Turner, when he came into the league, people thought could have potential to maybe be a, 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 a all-star. You know, so clearly, you know, Indiana has really built a lot of talent there. Like, I remember my friend told me one time, Indiana is the place where a lot of C and B plus and B players co- go to grow and, and become A's and B's. Like, they're the, they're the, they're the team that you go to if you feel like you have a lot of talent. And maybe in the, in the team or in the situation you're in, you're not getting the opportunity to show it and they'll let you show it. Cause think about all the players who've came to Indiana and have played better than they played at their previous places. I mean, think about it. Oladipo broke out after he lost left Oklahoma City, you know? Michael Brogdon, we all knew was good with Milwaukee, but obviously with Giannis becoming the star and everything like that, he was just a part of it. Now, you know, he's, you know, especially now, I mean, you know, he's, he's having a chance to shine more, really show his impact, you know? Same thing with Sabonis. You know, he got draft, he got traded from Oklahoma City in the Paul George trade to Indiana, and you see what happened there. So... It, 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 Indiana is a great place, I feel like, with the type of city they have as well to really kind of take the opportunity to really branch out and really show people, hey, I can play. You know, I'm not a guy who who just, you can just be anytime you want or do any time thing you want. You know, I, I can play in this league and I can play at a high level with, with some of the best guys. So it, it's really just depending on you and what you think about the situation. But TJ Warren, I think, is somebody who we'll have to see when the entire Indiana Pacers team is healthy, what he looks like. But I definitely think that he is a guy who, like I said, he'll be able to score. 
he may not obviously the numbers he's putting up like Quinn Cook said in his interview after the game the law of average the averages of our law of averages eventually he'll come back down to earth and he won't put up these numbers but TJ Warren to me could be a 20 point scorer in this league for sure he could be he could be a guy who could be fighting for years to come as the top scorer in the Indiana Pacers for years to come because like I said you don't just forget how to stop scoring the basketball and that's what TJ Warren is is a score Bo, he has a very interesting matchup coming up because remember what happened earlier this year with Miami and, and, and Indiana and TJ Warren and Jimmy Butler. So their next game will be against them. And it will be interesting to see what happens because obviously Butler hasn't played the last three games and he's coming back uh, for this game. So that's going to be a very interesting matchup and probably will get eyes on the matchup just because of that individual beef that they have. But then now we're going to get into the Lakers. Uh, obviously the Lakers are currently, no, obviously they clinched number one seed, the number one seed in the Western Conference. No hands down, no ifs, ands, or buts. That, that is solidified. They are the number one seed. But there are some concerns about the Lakers because of how they played. Obviously, I feel like some of the concerns are over the top because I feel like, listen, especially after last night, after, after the Indiana game, because listen, they shot the best they've shot from three. LeBron had 31. They honestly played one of their best overall team games of the entire bubble yesterday against, against, against the Pacers. But the thing is, is that one thing that has been consistent, inconsistent, is Anthony Davis. He's had two big games since he's been back, and he's had three, four games of just, eh. Anthony Davis right now, I think, is trying to find his way. And I think that's why you're seeing the differences in performances with the Lakers. And why they don't look as impressive. Because Anthony Davis doesn't look impressive. You know. And even with Anthony Davis not playing that well. They still had a chance to win the game. LeBron said that after the game. They still had a chance to win. Now listen. LeBron had a great game. Had 31. He was able to come out of that little slump he was having. Where LeBron never really had any big games. He was just kind of even kill. Now he came out 31. But Anthony Davis had 8 points. And he's been shooting very inefficiently. And so. I think that. Anthony Davis. Obviously everybody knows is the key to the playoff success of the Lakers. If Anthony Davis is not playing as well as he could play as the top five player that everybody says he is, the Lakers probably will lose to the Clippers and maybe potentially could get upset by a team if they play, if they're on their P's and Q's. And so I think the concern, if you want to have any type of concern should be more with Anthony Davis, just seeing, okay, is he going to be able to consistently make shots because it's just you you're kind of surprised you know knowing the type of score Anthony Davis can be that he's struggling as much as he is offensively and so people are wondering you know what 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 is it is it that his legs aren't other him is it the bubble is affected but we've also seen those games where he dominated so it's like okay he can do it so now he just has to figure it out himself and like I said Lakers are not a great three-point shooting team but obviously, like I said, in the game against Indiana, they, 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 they played well from the three. They did things better. LeBron looked like LeBron. So I'm sure, listen, depending on who they face in the first round, it's going to be a very interesting situation. Again, everybody kind of is aware, like, hey, Portland probably, out of all the teams, talent-wise, is probably the matchup that the Lakers probably, I guess you can say, wouldn't want because they're the most talented team. But at the same time, you know, if they're playing like this and they're struggling to hit shots and Anthony Davis is struggling to hit shots, I think most definitely the Portland Trailblazers can go into L.A. I mean, not go into L.A., but, you know, go into the series of L.A. and and beat L.A. Because, but that's the thing. Do you think there's going to be four games where Anthony Davis don't score or struggles to score and then the Lakers miss all the threes. Because even if the Lakers miss threes, if Anthony Davis and LeBron have big games, that, that can negate that. So we're going to have to see how that goes with that. So, you know, I don't think we need to push the panic button on the Lakers. We just need to watch and just and just see what happens with them. But that's all we have here for this segment. Stay tuned if you want to hear more about a deal that, that we have with a sports gambling company if you're into that. So stay tuned for that right here. Listen up, sports bettors. This is Bryce, here to tell you about my favorite sports book, and that's BetUS. Football, basketball, and baseball are all back, and that means it's time to get down your bets. I only endorse one sports book, and that is BetUS.com. Why, you ask? 
BetUS is the pioneer in online betting with more than 25 years in the biz. You need a sports book with integrity and longevity. You need to know what you're going to get paid. You need a sports book that's going to offer everything, including live betting, MMA, golf, horses, esports, entertainment, and all kinds of crazy crop bets and futures. Call today at 1 800 MyBet US. That's 1 800 MyBet US. And they will talk you through getting started. Nobody in the industry gives us bigger bonuses than Bet US. Join now, mention GSMC, and you can get up to 150% in bonuses on your first deposit. Nobody beats that. I bet at Bet US, and so should you. Join Bet US today. That's betus.com. Or call 1 800 My Bet US. Mention GSMC to get 150% in bonuses on your first deposit. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Last segment we discussed... TJ Warren, is he truly a breakout star? Is he truly a guy who, you know, this is this is his coming out party. This is the player who the Indiana Pacers have inherited from the, from the Phoenix Suns, and now they may have a potential great scorer on their hands, potential all-star in their hands. We talked about that. We also talked about the Lakers, and, and what really is wrong with the Lakers? Really, it's just inconsistent performances from Anthony Davis. You know, obviously they had some issues as a team, but I feel like it's just getting and playing through it. But if Anthony Davis has to play at a more consistent level, because if he plays at a consistent level, it doesn't matter to me if they're not hitting their threes on a clip. If LeBron and AD play the way they can, they could still be any team in the NBA. So, you know, for me, I don't really see much panic right now with the Lakers. The only time you would panic is if they were in a playoff series and they were down two games or down maybe 3-2 when they're playing terribly. You know, something like that. Outside of that, I wouldn't put any panic button into it or any panic stock into the Lakers right now as well. But now we're going to get into some more news and notes around the league. And we're going to start with Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons is 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 currently out and could be out for the rest of the playoffs. And bubble. Ben Simmons obviously... Got injured, coming down, non-contact injury. You know he's likely out for the season. He'll un- he 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 will undergo arthro- arthroscopic surgery on the left knee, and like I said, is all likely to miss the season. He's gonna have a loose body removed from his left knee as well. So obviously, you know, if you want to know, the loose body was a result of the left patella, you know, kind of getting messed up in the, in the when they had that victory over the Wizards on Wednesday, as that's the game he got hurt. And basically, the patella, aka the kneecap, in a way, popped out of place, but returned on its own. And so, obviously, the Sixers now don't have Ben Simmons for the rest of the, for the rest of the bubble, basically. And now, I mean, this kind of makes things interesting. From the, from the games I've seen, they have kind of looked better without Ben Simmons. But we could also say they look better without Embiid when they play with Ben Simmons. And there was actually some numbers that actually show that they actually play better offensively and defensively without Ben Simmons. I mean, I think to me, we've seen that both Embiid and Simmons don't necessarily work that well together. But when they individually can run the show with the team, they can, they're, they're a good team. Because remember, the 76ers even without each other, it's not like they're void of talent. They still have Tobias Harris. They still have Richardson. They still have Alec Burks. They still have those guys. They're not an untalented team by any stretch of the imagination. They're a very talented team still. 
It's just, obviously, since Ben Simmons and Embiid are the top two guys you look at as the superstars of the group, you're like, oh, you can't you know be as successful as your superstar. But the 76ers, I feel like, have played better without Ben, just in general throughout the season, and even in just the small sample size we've had so far in the bubble. You know, obviously they suffered that loss to Portland, but even in that game against Portland, listen, Lillard, we're going to talk about his performance in the next segment, but he had a big game, and he was on a mission. Pacers were on a mission. But the Sixers, to the end, basically could have won this game without either Embiid or Ben, because Embiid didn't play in that game. And so, to me, it shows that clearly, you know, Ben, if, if, if the Sixers play better and potentially win a playoff series without Ben Simmons, that might switch the management saying, well, maybe we can build our team around Embiid. Maybe we can, we can decide to go ahead and build our team around Jalel Embiid and we'll let Ben Simmons find somewhere else. Like, this really could be that type of situation because the whole time, we thought it was Embiid was going to be the one who goes and Simmons is the one who stays because in the wider scheme of things, the skill set would work better for the type of team the 76ers probably have, you would maybe say potentially. But then you're looking at how they're playing with Embiid and now guys who could score as well are now having more opportunities to score because Simmons is now on the floor. Because they have guys, like I said, who can create their own shot. So, and in, in, in it makes Tobias now the second score, which I think is his best spot. He's a great, he's a good third score, but I think Tobias, we've seen, he's averaged 20 something points a game in this league. He could be that second score if they need it. And then it, it's kind of like this. If, if Simmons was limited offensively. You knew he was going to do his damage in the fast break and if he could get past you going to the rim. Tobias can do his damage in the perimeter and can get to the rim from time to time. So it actually could be a more better advantage because even if Ben's down on the floor, you still got to defend Tobias. And then B can still kill you in the paint. So really, it, it kind of has a good game dynamic because now Tobias can beat you on the outside and, and B can beat you in the paint. And then, like I said, you still got Glenn Robinson. You still got Shake Milton. You still got Al Horford. You still got all those other guys who can make some plays around that. And it still works as a team. So it'll be interesting, I think, to see, you know, how it all looks when it all comes together when it comes to the 76ers and how they're going to look without Ben because these games could maybe make management say listen we might need to look into trading Ben and listen the, I'm, listen the 76ers are actually in a fantastic position right now because either one of those players or all of them are still both of them are still very young they will get teams wanting to trade for them you might be able to get more for Simmons and Embiid potentially, but you're going to get some people. And then you got to think, if we're going to build the team around Embiid, then what do we want? What would, what, what would help? Honestly, if I'm the 76ers, I would maybe look at the Orlando model of 08, 09, the Dwight Howard team, a dominant big man. And you put shooters around him. Embiid has shown he can pass. And, 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 and I think it simplifies everybody's role. B knows, okay, I got shooters. I need to be in the paint. I need to dominate in the paint. Yeah, I can take the jumper. Yeah, I can take the mid-range, but I need to be in the paint. And then you could have shooters surrounding him, and then boom, the 76ers still could be just as relevant as they are next year, even without Ben Simmons. So I think it's something that they definitely, or should definitely, attempt to look into, for sure. Now we're going to get to a couple of performances. I know I talked, I said, I talked about Damian Lillard next segment. It's really this segment. But we're actually talking to start with him. I'm going to end the segment with Damian Lillard. But we're going to talk about Luka Doncic. Luka Doncic had a huge game against the Bucks. 36, 19, and 14, beating the Bucks in overtime. Man, this, this guy, Luka Doncic, he's amazing. He, he, he truly, at his age... Doing it the way he's doing it, the moves he put on in that game. I watched that game. I watched the end of the game. He truly played lights out. You know, and if this was one of the best games I think he's played in the late. Because, you know, one of the things that on, on Luka is that he doesn't play well late in games. That if you rough him up a little bit, he gets off his game. And he was roughed up a little bit in this game. If you watch the game, he was roughed up a little bit. And it was late. And even in overtime, he played well. He made key shots and made key plays to win the game. And, you know, Luca is a guy who 
has everybody knows he clearly is a superstar player in this league. Hey, listen, right now they're slated right now to play. It looks like maybe the Houston Rockets, maybe, uh, or the Clippers. One of the two. Both teams are going to be tough to beat. Cause I, but and Luka has to have monstrous games for them to be able to beat them. And Kristaps Porzingis has to come along for the ride too and have great games. But the thing about Luka is that it's not like he can't do it. Like, Luka can come up there and put these numbers up every game, it feels like. He, he, he honestly comes off to you as like, if Luka needs to put up 30 plus a night with 10 assists and 10 rebounds, he could honestly do it. And that might be what gets him to be able to upset a team like the Clippers or Houston. And and then seeing it against the the champion, I mean not the champion, but the 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 leading contenders out of the East in Milwaukee, you know against Giannis and all them, it really shows. Because like I said, Luka's a big mismatch for a lot of teams because he's a point guard who's like six ten, and you know, ha- and, and the thing about Luka, I think what makes his game so so great to watch is again he doesn't his game is not based off athleticism. He can barely jump. But his he, he's just so smooth. He's just his handles are so smooth. It's it's it still kind of gets you in a daze defensively, and he he does it. It, it it seems like he's in rhythm. There was a move he put on Wesley Matthews in the game, I believe, in the fourth quarter. I believe it. You, it is a great example of it. He 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 crossed him over two times, and and he made the jumper, and it was just like so smooth. And Wesley Matthews is one of the better defenders in the league, so don't make it seem like no, let's not make it seem like Wesley Matthews is some scrub. He ain't no scrub, but. That just shows you Luka Doncic's offensive game is just great. He he has one of the best offensive games in the league. Even though we don't talk about him up there, he 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 does. His game is just not a very his game just isn't a game that's going to like wow, like you know, blow your mind. But it's definitely a game that you you definitely come to appreciate. You definitely come to appreciate. And now we're gonna get into the next performance, and a big performance, a huge performance by Damian Lillard of the Portland Trailblazers. As you know, against the Clippers, he missed free throws down the stretch that could have sealed it for the for the Portland Trailblazers, and they ended up losing that game. Obviously, if you're aware, Pat Beverly was on the sideline screaming Dame time. After he missed those two free throws. And also, obviously, Damian Lillard, you know, Paul George says something. He says something Paul George, you know, a little social media stuff. So, obviously, this game is a back-to-back against, you know, the Sixers. And he 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 dropped 51. And, and it was vintage Lillard. He dropped 51 points. And now has solidified himself as still the ninth spot in the ninth. He's still there's still the ninth spot in the Western Conference. Also, with that loss, the Pelicans and Kings have been eliminated from contention as the Pelicans lost to the Spurs also on Sunday. And so, listen, I think a lot of momentum is building towards the Portland Trailblazers that people want to see Portland in the playoffs. People want to see Portland versus LA. Portland has came into this bubble and has played every game like it's their last. And, and, and you could just see the intensity when they play, and it's, it, it, it's intoxicating. It's just like, you know Portland is about their business. You know Portland is about the game. You know Portland is here to win. You know they're here to survive. And and, and right now, you know, for, for what a lot of people see, it's just it's hard to sit here and say they won't. They're still battling the Spurs and the Suns right now for that ninth spot. So obviously they have to still keep winning. But, you know, Lillard just is an amazing player. He he, he really is... I, I don't know if people have ever considered him a top five point guard. I'm sure some people have. But I feel like he's borderline top five for a lot of people. But for me, he's in my top five, firmly. Because... He he's a dead eye shooter. He can score with the best. He like I said, he's extremely athletic. 
gets his players involved, great leader. It, it, it's just everything about him, you know, it, it's hard not to be impressed with a player like Damian Lillard. And you could tell, listen, he is giving it his all every season, every game. And that's something you got to appreciate about him. And in do or die situations, he's, he's showing out. He is showing out right now. It feels like the Portland Trailblazers are in playoff mode right now. And they haven't even got to the playoffs. If that playing game they have will be probably one of the best games we see this entire playoff of Portland's in it, which I expect them to be. So definitely exciting to me to see. But that's all the time we have here for this segment. Coming up next, we're going to kind of break down the playoff matches that are currently set right now. Obviously, we'll have the true set coming up next show. But right now, we're going to have the playoff. We're going to talk and break down the playoff matches from both conferences right here on the podcast. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Last segment we discussed Ben Simmons being out for the 76ers, what that means for the 76ers moving forward. What that means in terms of just, this is a very interesting situation the Sixers are in. Embiid has a chance to now be the player of the day. He comes out and shows that y'all should keep me. And the team plays well with me. So then maybe the Sixers may decide to go and say, hey, if we want to break him up, Simmons is the one that we trade away. So we discussed that. Also, we discussed big performances from Luka Doncic and Damian Lillard, both having tremendous nights. One Luca on Saturday and Damian on Sunday having huge games, you know, just playing well, playing great, showing you, you know, the star power of both player. It, it basically, you know, like I said, there's been a lot of great performances in the bubble so far and we, and we really hope to see more moving forward. But now we're going to break down playoff matchups. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do Eastern Conference playoff matchups this segment. And then our last segment on the show, we're going to get into Western Conference ones. Since that's the more interesting and juicier conference, you want to end, end the show with something juicy. But Eastern Conference is just as, as interesting. Don't get me wrong. Eastern Conference is extremely interesting. has a lot of storylines going into it. Now, obviously, if you think about the first two matchups we're going to get into, it may not be. But trust me, when you get to those other two matchups... It's going to be probably very, very intriguing to keep an eye on the two. So the first matchup we're going to get into is the 1-8 matchup. All the Eastern Conference spots have basically been decided in terms of who's in. The Wizards have lost almost every game they've been in the bubble. So the Magic have clinched their playoff spot, and Brooklyn has clinched their playoff spot. So they are in. That is your Eastern Conference playoffs. Those are the teams that are going to be in the playoffs. So, 1-8, Bucks Magic. Obviously, not a game that people are probably going to flock to and say, oh, we got to change our channel for this game. This this is a game we got to we gotta go out of our way to watch. Like, listen, we, we get it. People aren't going to sit here and flock to this game. But this is going to be interesting for the Bucks just to see, you know, how quickly can you finish off from it? Does it go five? Are you going to finish it in four like a lot of people expect? How good do you look? Obviously, Chris Middleton's looking much better recently in, in previous games. Giannis still looks dominant. Obviously, again, you probably want to try to get through the series with no injuries if you're Milwaukee. You know, because obviously these types of series where you're kind of the more dominant team, the better team in all facets of the game, and you're just kind of like, all right, we're going to win this series. 
we want to finish this as fast as possible, but we also don't want to get injured. Because if that happens, that could help hurt us in our next series, which will probably be a much, just a much tougher team. So obviously that's what it looks like. Obviously Orlando, for them, I mean, listen, it's the typical situation. It's, it's the typical situation. They just they 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 have the chance to maybe make Milwaukee work harder than they want. They have a chance for you know to maybe make some noise and and basically just shake some things up. Really, in this position, they're just here to maybe make Milwaukee play more than they thought they were going to play and shake some things up. Remember, last season they beat the, actually the defending champion Toronto Raptors at Game One, and everybody was like, "Oh snap." <laughs> Now, obviously, they lost four straight, but like, like just doing that, like just making him have to play that extra game, making because that probably made Toronto say, "All right, we we need to step it up." Because sometimes, you know, Milwaukee could come into this series. Usually, game ones are usually the games they come into the the series. Oh, we'll beat Orlando. They're not an issue, and then they get beat game one. It's like, oh snap! Again, it's not like you're in danger of losing the series, but it's like. Okay, so clearly we can't just lazy on in. We get, we gotta play good basketball to beat this team four consecutive times and take care of business and take this seriously. So that's basically the situation with both teams. Obviously, I, I'm pretty sure everybody, except maybe some Orlando fans, believe that Milwaukee will probably handle the series in four games at most five. Next matchup. Raptors and Nets. Again, not a matchup that this year isn't exciting. Now, next year, KD and Kyrie, now nah, this is a must-see matchup. This year, it's not. But I want to say Brooklyn has played well. They, they've had some games where they look like that people thought they would look like with not having their top players. But they've also played hard in games. They've played well in games. I mean, they they played against guys like Clippers. They played well. Like, you know, they still got some talent. Like, Chris LeVert. He's the number one guy, and he's been playing well. Joe Harris, still sharpshooter. They, like I said, they still, you know, Hollis Jefferson, like, they got guys. They can play well. Like, you know, and, and really, this is a series where, listen, the Raptors have traditionally never been great in game ones. They've literally, even with Kawhi last year, they lost game one. They have literally always lost their game one games. If this, if the trend continues this year, obviously, Brooklyn will go up one nothing. Yeah, that might be all they win, but still, Brooklyn has played well to me. For the talent that they've lost, they're still exceeding my expectations, in my opinion. And Toronto, again, it's one of those games they need to come into the game. They don't need to think, oh, it's Brooklyn, we'll beat them. They need to go into the game, make a statement, finish the series off as quickly as possible in four games. If, if but, I'm, but listen, I think this is going to be a tougher series that I think Milwaukee's going to be in. I think the Nets... All it takes is Avert having that big game, and Joe Harris knocking down threes, and et cetera, et cetera. And now the Raptors are in for a dogfight against Brooklyn. They're in for a dogfight. So, definitely, they definitely need to take this, this game serious. They don't need to come into this game and think, oh, we'll beat them, it's no problem. That's the only thing that you would have an issue with, is that they're taking the Brooklyn Nets lightly, and they probably definitely shouldn't do that. They need to take it more seriously and believe, like, okay, we need to get into this game and really play well, play hard. Now, we're going to get into the games that now may seem a little bit more interesting on paper. So we're going to get to the 3-6 matchup. Celtics and 76ers. Now, the Raptors have clinched the number two seed in the Eastern Conference. So that's been a solidified. So Celtics will be the three. And unless 76ers can jump the Pacers, they will be the six. So this matchup in previous years, the Celtics have had the 76ers, you know, number. And they have... You know, they have, you know, been basically the 76ers kryptonite. Now, obviously, like I said earlier, Ben Simmons is basically probably most likely out for the season. So the Celtics 
are going to be the team that, you know, should be the favorites in the series. I wouldn't be surprised if people think that they're going to beat the 76ers in five games, even six at most. But like I've said, I've seen the 76ers play better basketball without Ben. And if, 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 if Embiid can be healthy and dominate, I think the Sixers could definitely make this a real series with the Celtics. You know, even with Ben and, 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 the, and, and Embiid, the way the Sixers were playing, you just weren't, you weren't sure if, you know, they would be able to beat the Celtics just because of how the Sixers were playing in general. But like I said, I feel like the Sixers are playing better basketball. So I feel like they definitely, if they continue that, they definitely could play well. And it's crazy because, you know, the Sixers, the start of the season was looked at as the second best team in Eastern Conference in a lot of people's eyes. They were looked at as the other team besides Milwaukee. And now they're 6 C, which was unexpected. And now they're in a position where there is a more than likely possibility they'll be beaten in the first round. Talk about a complete change in expectations. Like, it, like obviously, it would be more crazier if they didn't make the playoffs. But just having that expectation because of the talent they possess and now basically facing a potential first-round elimination, it's it's kind of like, dang, you know? It, it feels like regardless of how this goes, this season for the Sixers was a failure. And so, you know, and, and, and what it, what it, would it top it off by losing to the team that you've lost to multiple times in the playoffs previously? You know, it, like I said, the Sixers could really, you know, change some things and really like really flip some things up they really could transform you know as a team from where they are to now and you know as 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 a team they're trying and they're doing what they can and we we have to just see how it all works out at the end of the day because i think celtics i think have this handily I think it'll be interesting to see how they monitor Kimba Walker. Because they're going to need Kimba for the playoffs. They're going to need him to play more minutes. They're going to need him to play more consistently. Obviously, Jason Dinn, if he continues to be what he is, you would feel like they're in really good hands. And if Jalen Brown and Gordon Hayward and everybody else can do their part, the Celtics will be a very formidable team during the entire Eastern Conference playoffs. And then our last matchup we're going to get into... The Pacers in the Heat, 4-5 matchup. Heat currently are 4th, Pacers are 5th. Big game between them on Monday night. Obviously, this podcast has been recorded before the game is played, so obviously, by the time this is released, we'll know, but both teams currently, at the time of this recording, are tied for 4th and 5th. So whoever really wins this game, which really doesn't matter, if this was regular season, this would be a big game. Since it's not, it's not because it would basically determine who gets home court advantage. But basically, yeah, it's pretty solidified. Again, unless the 76ers win two straight and then whoever from the Pacers to the Heat lose two straight, they're going to play each other in the first round of the playoffs. Obviously, we've talked about the storylines hiding behind or riding around. You know, the Heat and Pacers, obviously, just basically between Jimmy Butler and TJ Warren. Obviously, it's it's going to be a game for 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 a lot of people to pay attention to. It's a series between two teams that are just it's just a good series to watch. It, it's not a big series in terms of stars like oh wow, but it's just a game that if you're a true basketball fan, you're like I want to watch this series. I want to see two good quality teams play each other and see who's the better one. Really, it really is. Like if you think about it, so a lot of people consider Jimmy Butler a B plus star. And a lot of people consider Victor Oladipo a B plus star, right? If if Sabonis was playing, you would have the battle of two up and coming big men. You know, you, you you know you have a lot of young players in this game, and it, it's it's one of those things where this series could go either way. I could see the Heat winning this game in six. I, I I had this feeling if the Pacers win the series, it would be in seven. But I could see the Heat winning it in six. I don't think this will be... I think it will go no longer than seven, but it won't be any shorter than six. I think that's how competitive this series is going to be. 
this will probably be the most competitive series of the first round for the Eastern Conference based off the two teams. And, you know, listen, if TJ Warren continues to play the way he plays, it's going to make some fireworks because, it's like, listen, they're playing now, and then literally in about a few days, they may have to play each other again four, five, six, seven times. And so basically, in about a span of two and two and a half weeks, they may have to play each other eight times, the Pacers in the heat. That's eight times for Jimmy Butler and TJ Warren to get into it. It's eight times for this for this this series to be actually maybe an intense series, a physical series, a series of just a lot of things. Like a lot of stuff could come out of this series, and I think it's, it's definitely one of the more exciting ones to watch. So we'll have to see what happens. I for me right now I'm going to take the Heat to win this series. But the series could go either way, in my opinion. But that's all the time we have here for this segment. Coming up next, we're going to now break down the first round matchups potentially in the West. Obviously, the A spot, I'm going to probably talk about both Memphis and Portland. And maybe San Antonio. But we're going to talk about Memphis and Portland just in case whoever match up and then other matchups in the Western Conference. So stay tuned for that. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Last segment, we broke down the Eastern Conference potential first round matchups currently based off seeding. The Eastern Conference teams have already been decided. The only really spots that are up for grabs are 4th and 5th and 6th. Potentially, the Sixers could move into the 5th spot, but more than likely, it will probably be Heat and Pacers at 4 and 5 and the Sixers at 6, but obviously things could change or could swap and be Pacers at 4, Heat at 5, depending on whoever wins the game tomorrow or the game on Monday, I believe. So, obviously... We'll have to see how that matchup goes, but I gave, I broke down all the matchups. First round matchups in the East don't look always the most enticing, but definitely don't just sleep on the Eastern Conference. There are still games that you should watch during the series for all of them. But now we're going to go over to the Western Conference, and we're going to discuss the more map first round matchups potentially. And obviously the eighth seed is definitely up for grabs and a lot of things happening. So obviously it's a little different here. But what we're going to do is we're going to discuss in terms of first round matches with the Lakers 1-8 with Memphis. And then we're also going to do 1-8 with the Trailblazers and then 1-8 with the Spurs. So we're going to discuss that. We won't do the Suns just because of time constraints. But we'll try to do those three teams and discuss each matchup with the Lakers and how they would go. So we're going to get to the Lakers and Memphis matchup. That's the current 1-8 matchup as Memphis is still currently in the 8th spot with a half a game lead over the Portland Trailblazers. Memphis is hitting some dangerous territory right now as they could lose this spot if they lose any more games and Memphis and the Spurs and the Suns continue to win. But if they were able to play the Fricklers in the first round the way they're playing, it looks like they're going to get swept. It looks like Memphis Grizzlies are going to get swept. It's it, They just haven't... They've had the hardest straight for schedule to end, the, to end this, this this bubble and end the season. So it makes sense logically like, okay, yeah, they're playing the best teams and they're an AC that's a below 500. So, I mean, can we literally sit here and expect them to sit here and beat both these teams? But at the same time, it's like they are fighting for something as well as the top teams they're playing may have not been and they're still losing these games. So definitely... It's definitely going to be interesting to kind of see how it all looks because Memphis is in a position where they play the Lakers. It's probably not going to be 
a, the best series in terms of quality. Maybe the Memphis can still a game if John Morant has a big game. But especially with J- Jalen Jackson Jr. out for the rest of the, the bubble, too, it, it just seems like Memphis is just basically just trying to hang in as long as they can. Another matchup that could potentially be a 1-8 matchup is the Lakers and the Portland Trailblazers. Obviously, this is the matchup that people say will be the most competitive. Could potentially, if 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 the Lakers continue to play the way they play and Portland continues to play the way they play, could maybe be a potential upset alert, potentially. Obviously, Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum have the advantage on that Lakers backcourt, but obviously LeBron James has the advantage on the entire Pacers, of, not Pacers, but Portland team. So... This game, this series, I honestly think at this point is the one that everybody wants to see. Is they want to see Lakers and Blazers. Because they know that's the most competitive and highly anticipating and appealing series that they have out of the teams that could potentially be in that eighth spot. Next ser- game series potentially is the Spurs and the Lakers. Obviously, this again is another series where it's just like, eh. Spurs have never been a team that you've ever flock to the TV to watch but I mean obviously again you would maybe think this would be potentially a sweep though the Spurs have played very well during the bubble they played very very well they played better Popovich definitely has these guys ready you know Popovich always was well coached the Spurs never beat themselves so if the Lakers make mistakes they definitely could capitalize and the Spurs may be able to take a game or two um but I think again this is a series that Lakers should be able to handle in my opinion, they should be able to handle the Spurs without too much of an issue and, you know, just see what happens. And we're going to slide the Suns in there real quick. Again, same way, they should be able to handle the Suns, even though the Suns have played great basketball, though. So I definitely don't think the Suns would get swept. I think they're going to take a game from the Lakers. The way they're playing right now, they're playing some great basketball. But again, I don't think it'll be anything more past, AB at best, a six-game series. But maybe like they like that some people like to call it a gentleman sweep, which is a five game series. So we'll have to see how that goes. The two seven matchup right now is the Mavericks and Clippers. Obviously, we discussed a little bit about it. Obviously, Luca and Przingis is going against Kawhi and Paul George. A very exciting matchup. High scoring games probably. Obviously, the advantage here is Clippers because the Clippers are a better defensive team than the Mavericks. The Mavericks are not that good defensively. And so, Luka and, and Kristoff are going to have to take advantage of the matchups and really and, and really ball. I mean, listen, Luka's going against Patrick Beverly and Lou Williams. Kristoff is going against Montrez and if he gets back. And, you know, Zubak and everything. And just, it, it's kind of hard to kind of know where the series is going to go. No one thinks Mavericks are going to get swept by any stretch of the imagination, even though that would be a big statement for the for the Clippers to sweep a team like the Mavs. But you don't, I feel like it's kind of say, but you also don't want to sit here and say, oh, it's going seven. Because you don't think the Dallas Mavericks are technically ready yet, potentially, to, to push a team like the Clippers to that far. So it's kind of like, maybe six games would probably be the 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 where a lot of people would think the series would go, a six-game series. Honestly, if the Bavs made an upset here, it would be because Luka averaged 30-10-10 and 10, and Kristoff averaged like 10-10, 25 and 10. And literally, that's about 55 points between the two. And so all you got to do, and with this offense, the number one offense in the NBA, you know, Tim Hardaway gave you some shots. You know, everybody else makes plays. Mavericks could easily sit here and just score with the best of them. So the Clippers definitely need to be on their P's and Q's offensively, going against an offensive juggernaut like Dallas can be. But but the Dallas Mavericks have to be on their Q's because, remember, they're not the greatest defensive team. So, yeah, you may be able to outscore guys, but they could outscore you too. So we'll have to see how it all comes together. When it's all said and done with with the Mavs. Obviously that was a big win against Milwaukee. One of the best two-way teams in the league. So they clearly show they can play against a team like that. And again, high scoring game. But they, they, they're they capable of winning those types of games against those types of teams. Then we have the 3-6 matchup. Nuggets and Jazz. So this series is probably the one series that people... 
aren't necessarily going to tune into the most out of all the Western Conference first round matchups, in my opinion. Again, it depends on who the Lakers play in the first round. But if they play like Portland, I think this would be the series Nuggets and Jazz that might not get the same views and and and, and ratings like other series because Denver is an interesting team, but they're not a team that just sparks out to the general public. And Utah has not looked like a team that also jumps off to you. And they haven't really played well this bubble. And so the way it's looking, if the Nuggets are on their P's and Q's and Michael Porter Jr. continues to play hard and Jamal Murray gets back and he can play like he plays and Joker still plays well and with the depth that Denver has, they should be able to take care of this series in maybe five, six games. The Jazz obviously are missing Bogdanovich. They don't have a second score really outside of him. And they're not the same defensive team they were in previous years either, even though they're still a good defensive team. And I, I just think the Denver Nuggets have a lot of advantages on them. You know, you know, they just, they, I just think they're deeper and they're more talented. And so I think they're going to be able to get out of the series and go on to the next round. I think five, six games would be probably around the estimate for me of like where I think they would go. I think a lot of people would agree with me as well. Um, like I said, most important thing for me in this series, I wanted to want to see is, is Michael Porter. Because he's played so well ever since that big game. And I, listen, I, maybe he won't affect it this year. But if he becomes the star that we all think he can be with his talent, the Nuggets could have another star in their hands. And then with Joker, Jamal Murray, and Michael Porter Jr., and then Bobo, if he comes around, I mean, Denver looks like they have four potential stars on their team. And they will be a team that you definitely have to be reckoned with for the next few years in the Western Conference. Utah, like I said, just outside of Donovan Mitchell, Michael Conley has played better, but still just isn't what they thought they were going to get in him. Obviously, Rudy Gobert, they've tried to get Rudy Gobert more involved in the offense to the bubble. But I'd be like, let's be, let's, let's be honest. Rudy Gobert is not an offensive guy in terms of like he's going to drop 30 on you every night offensively. He's just not. If he hasn't missed that, he'll, he'll, he'll get you that 20 plus probably. But he's not a guy in this matchup going against Joker who can play in Bobo if they come off the bench. I don't think it'll be a matchup where he'll just dominate on the post. Like I said, there's no Bogdanovich. I mean, Joe Ingles kind of has been so-so. It just feels like the Jazz just don't have enough scoring to really compete in this in this series and, and beat the Nuggets, in my opinion. So I think Nuggets will win in about five, six games. And then the last series, we're going to get into a 4-5 matchup. My, to me, one of my most intriguing series is the Houston Rockets and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Yes, sir. Both teams. Quality, might I add. It's, it's the battle of small ball versus the young guns. You have Houston. You got two of the best players in the game. James Harden, Russell Westbrook. Small ball. Everybody, there's nobody in their starting lineup or really who plays who's over 6'7". So there you're going to be up and down, shooting things and getting to the rim. Going against Oklahoma City, led by Chris Paul. Veteran. Showing people he can still play. Might even look at this as a revenge series against the team who traded him. You got Steven Adams still doing his thing. He should have a big series because of the matchup. You know, Shea Gilgis-Alexander. Gallinari, all of them. What's going to be interesting, and I don't think a lot of people are talking about it, is Dennis Schroeder. Will he be able to, I guess, play during the series? I think he will. Obviously, if you don't know, he went, he, he said before the bubble that his wife is expecting a baby, and he was going to leave the bubble to go be with them and the, and the, and the kid. But obviously, you know, he, he's been there for about almost a week now. Um, playoffs are coming up. Obviously, when he comes back, he'll have to quarantine for however many days the NBA decides he needs to quarantine. So, you know, he's a big part of it. He's a potential six-man-of-the-year candidate. I think he needs to, if he comes back, he'll definitely help them. 
I think I'm still going to go with Houston this series, though, to win in six games. I, I think it'll be definitely an interesting series, and will definitely really kind of tell you with Houston, how are you feeling? Because, I mean, if they win that series, they'll play the Lakers in the first round, if the Lakers win their first round matchup, in the second round, in the semifinals. And so they're kind of looked at as the team Houston who – can kind of shake things up, who can kind of create some chaos in the Western Conference. Might change something that we've all expected with one of the LA teams. I feel like most people have always viewed the Clippers as a, uh, I guess, a less quality matchup for them than the Lakers, because obviously Lakers have the issue at the guard position, and Russell and and James coming at you, you know, that's going to be interesting, but I think the Rockets should be able to take care of business, but Oklahoma City's had a great season. They played extremely well, and they're going to definitely compete with Houston this series. And you're going to see, you know, the, like I said, the return of Chris Paul, you know, in a playoff series because Houston, just everything. So it's going to be very interesting to happens. But thank you for tuning in here to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Thank you for letting me be a part of your day. Don't forget to listen to our other amazing podcasts here on the GSMC Podcast Network. Don't forget to leave us a review, subscribe. All that. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at GSMC underscore basketball. That's right, GSMC underscore basketball. This is your host, Bryce, signing out. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program